So every year in the United States, two million people visit their doctor because of some kind of rotator cuff problem. So in this video, we're gonna break down the causes of rotator cuff tendinopathies, how we assess them, and crucially, how we treat them too. If that sounds good, let's dive in. Hey guys, I'm Khalid, welcome back to Clinical Physio. So before we get into the nitty gritty, let's check out some quick anatomy on the rotator cuff. So with our Clinical Physio anatomy model, let's remove the major muscles around the upper limb and we can isolate the four rotator cuff muscles. So we can see that all of them originate on the scapular bone and insert into the proximal humerus. And their main role is to work together as a group of four to provide dynamic stability of the shoulder joint. Now, if we break down their function individually, we have three muscles on the posterior surface of the scapula, which insert into the greater tuberosity of the humerus. We have the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and teres minor muscles. Now, all three of these individually are considered to be lateral rotators of the glenohumeral joint, with the supraspinatus also having a suggested role in abduction. Now the subscapularis sits on the anterior surface of the scapula, inserting into the lesser tuberosity of the humerus, and is considered in isolation as a medial rotator of the glenohumeral joint. But I can't stress enough, whilst we can look at those muscles individually, the key function of the rotator cuff is to work together to provide dynamic stability of the glenohumeral joint. So causes for rotator cuff tendinopathies. We're commonly thinking about overhead activity, and we're always listening out in our patient's story for an indication that the rotator cuff may have had to work harder than normal, either in the short term or over a gradual longer period. So what about an example of the shorter term? Well, it could be that your patient has come to see you after a weekend of really heavy DIY. They've been painting the walls, they've been painting the ceilings, lots of overhead activity where there's been a sudden increased demand on the rotator cuff. Or we tend to see this in a longer time frame where, again, you might have repeated overhead activity for decorators, window cleaners, builders, people who are consistently using their arms with high weights or high repetition over a long period of time. Now, age is quite important here. We tend to find that rotator cuff tendinopathies tend to present themselves in the under 50 age group. These individuals have stronger rotator cuffs generally, but they are still susceptible to that period of overuse or increased demand. Now, in the older generations, we find that the rotator cuff does become more and more degenerative. So when they have either a, a trauma of some sort or that gradual repetitive loading over a period of time, they may gradually progress from a tendinopathy into more of a rotator cuff degenerative tear presentation. So really important to think under the age of 50 is when we normally see those tendinopathies. So signs and symptoms in the subject of history, what are we looking for? Well, if we think about those causes, make sure you listen out in your patient's history for those potential episodes of overuse or increased demand placed on the rotator cuff, either in the short term or the long term. These patients will commonly present with pain around the proximal lateral humerus rather than deep within the shoulder joint. Don't be surprised if they have pain on active range of movement or on resisted tests, or in particular upon loading the shoulder, if we think about, again, that episode of overuse or increased demand, meaning that those tendons are gonna be irritated. So onto the objective examination, what are we looking for? Classic signs. Well, we're thinking that our patient is likely to have some reduction in their active range of movement, perhaps towards flexion or abduction in the 120, 130 degrees of range. But we're certainly not expecting high level stiffness and a significant loss of active range of movement. That's more akin to something like frozen shoulder. So think about that differentiation. And the other key thing for me is gonna be thinking about our isometric resisted tests or our tests where we're gonna load those rotator cuff tendons. Think back to the problem itself. The tendons are irritated. They don't like contracting and therefore those resisted tests may well be painful. 
but we're not expecting them to be significantly weak as you may expect with something like a rotator cuff tear. So make sure that you make that distinct differentiation. Now, a quick caveat in terms of the objective assessment. Imagine that your patient has just come in to see you one to two days after that really heavy weekend of DIY with loads of overhead painting. You can imagine that they're probably going to be pretty sore. Those rotator cuff tendons are going to be in that reactive tendinopathy phase and as a result at that specific timing you may find that they do really struggle with range of movement. Everything's really painful and irritable. You do their resisted tests and it's really challenging for them. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they've had a massive rotator cuff tear. It might just mean that you have to think about the fact that they haven't had a major trauma the likelihood is that they've just irritated their rotator cuff and you might be looking to see whether or not their symptoms settle down in the early to mid short term, perhaps in the next five to six, seven days and see if you can then bring them back in at that phase to try and do those tests again and see if they have more ability. So moving on to treatment, let's start with what's not a good option and that is surgery. Now, particularly in the past, you may have heard the term subacromial impingement being used for rotator cuff symptoms, but we don't use that term anymore. And a big factor in this was the really important seesaw trial conducted by Beard et al. 2018, where they found that subacromial decompression was really ineffective for patients with rotator cuff tendinopathy. So moving on from there, Lewis et al. 2015 highlighted in their paper that pain reduction is a priority in managing irritable rotator cuff tendinopathy. Now that tells me two things. Number one, any exercises that we give the patients needs to be at a manageable, tolerable level. Otherwise, we're not allowing for that pain reduction. And the second thing is that it might explain why corticosteroid injections are still commonly used for this patient group. So the idea here is that steroid injections can provide a significant dose of pain relief to the glenohumeral joint. Hopefully this settles down the rotator cuff tendons in the short term, allows our patient to engage in their rehabilitation with less pain so that they can go on and re-strengthen and get back to their previous condition. But we do know that steroid injections are far less appropriate and less effective in the long term. Hopewell et al. in 2021 completed a multi-centered randomized controlled trial and found that corticosteroid injections had no long-term benefit for rotator cuff disorders. But another really important thing to say is that we know that repeated steroid injections are also not a good treatment option as well. We find that in the rotator cuff in particular, repeated steroid injections can actually weaken the tendons and therefore don't be surprised if you hear orthopedic consultants offering patients one, maybe two injections, but not three, four, five, six, in order to not give them that risk. So as a result of all this, it's really important that we educate our patients and explain that the steroid injection itself is not the cure. The steroid injection is simply the short term option to allow us to reduce our pain levels and thus engage in our rehab, which is the long term solution. So as a result, let's get into our exercises. OK, so what are the best exercises for the rotator cuff? Well, unfortunately, the evidence doesn't really push us one way or the other and doesn't provide us with the best protocols. We do know that the evidence highlights that isometric exercises are less effective and don't really help with pain reduction at the shoulder, as indicated by Clifford et al. 2020. And whilst there is future research, which is aiming to look at concentric exercises versus eccentric versus heavy, slow resistance, at this moment in time, we don't know what is absolute best practice. And therefore, I always give three simple tips for therapists thinking about their rotator cuff exercises. Number one, make sure it's manageable and tolerable for the patient without significantly increasing their pain levels. Number two, make sure it's meaningful for the patient. Does it replicate their hobbies, their activities, their movements to make sure that they get strong in the right activities? And number three, making sure that there is some element of lifting involved because the lifting will engage the rotator cuff muscles in their key function of providing 
dynamic stability through movement. So bearing all that in mind, here are some common examples of exercises that I give my patients. In the early stages, some really simple stuff like lying your patient supine and then doing a simple upward shoulder press, 12 repetitions, two sets. Of course, use a weight that's comfortable for your patient and don't be afraid to start with no weight at all. We can also think about a wall sit with shoulder flexion. Here you can use no weight or you can use something like a TheraBand to provide a gradual and small lateral rotation contraction. Again, you can think about eight to 12 repetitions, perhaps over two sets. In the midterm, you can think about the simple shoulder press. You can think about a flexion shoulder press going straight up and down in a flexion manner or you can think about an abduction shoulder press going up and down in an abduction type manner. Here, I think about eight to 10 repetitions across two sets, and you can also play around with your weights. You can have no weight, you can have a simple dumbbell, or you can make it a slightly unstable weight like a kettlebell to really think about that dynamic stability element. And in the latter stages, one of the key things I like to think about is exercises which can take my patient through range from full internal rotation to full external rotation or vice versa. So an example of this might be something like a lawnmower, as you can see on the screen now, where we're going from full internal rotation to full external rotation. I might think about eight to 12 repetitions across two to three sets. Or you can think about a TheraBand push through, which takes our patient from full external rotation to full internal rotation. Once again, eight to 12 repetitions, two to three sets. But a final thing to say is that there's lots of really good evidence to highlight that including the lower limb in our shoulder rehab is really beneficial. So don't forget about squats with arm movement, bridges with arm movement, lunges with arm movements. They really help to rehabilitate the rotator cuff. So guys, that's all from me. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like even more from Clinical Physio, check out the links in the description below for our website, clinicalphysio.com, or our social media channels such as Instagram, at Clinical Physio. I'm Khalid, thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.